Uh, welcome to the artist talk for Geometric Alhamia, a cultural transliteration. This exhibition is currently on view at the Robert C. Williams Museum of Papermaking located in Atlanta, Georgia. It'll be on view from September 5th through December 6th, 2023. Um, this is a program uh, put on by the Robert C. Williams Museum of Papermaking. And our mission is to collect, preserve, increase, disseminate uh, knowledge about papermaking, past, present, and future. We have a number of uh, permanent exhibitions, a couple of um, changing uh, galleries, which is where the, uh, Geometric Alhamia is featured. And we also do programming for um, uh, ages five to adults. So tonight we'll hear from Rennie Gower, Jorge Benitez, um, Susan Schultz, and Julia Townsend. And after all the presentations, um, the floor will be open for questions. So we ask that people please submit their questions via the Q&A button and reserve the chat for making observations, comments, or sharing uh, resources. That way we can find uh, your questions more easily at the end of the presentation. Um, questions can be submitted at any time during the uh, presentations. So um, I'm going to do the bios and then I'm passing it on off to uh, Rennie. So Jorge Benitez is a native of uh, Cuba who spent his formative years in uh, Belgium and is fluent in French and Spanish. His works reflect an earlier career in advertising and interest in uh, the American culture wars and his studies of the links between words, images, and demagogic um, politics. After the events of September 11th, he became increasingly interested in his own Spanish ancestry and the Iberian links to the Muslim world while simultaneously uh, mistrusting the notion of identity. He currently participates in regional and international exhibitions and writes on subjects ranging from the Cuban revolution to postmodernism. His work is represented in uh, corporate collections in the Virginia Museum of Fine Arts. Before and after his retirement, Professor Benitez has taught drawing, art theory, and the history of visual communications in the Communication Arts Department of Virginia Commonwealth University. Uh, Rennie Gower received a 2023 Virginia Commission for the Arts Fellowship for Works on Paper. And in 2020, she also received a Pola Krasner Foundation grant. In 2017, she was awarded SECAC's Award for Outstanding Artistic Achievement. And in uh, 2014, she received the College Arts Association's Distinguished Teacher of Art Award, as well as Distinguished Teaching Awards from Virginia Commonwealth University and VCU Arts. Her artwork is represented in many prestigious collections and has been exhibited at international and national venues for over 40 years. In addition to her painting practice, she curates award-winning traveling exhibitions that include the garden, flashpoints, material, intent, fused, geometric alhamia, a cultural transliteration, and pulped under pressure, the art of handmade paper. After 37 years, Professor Emerita Gower retired from Virginia Commonwealth University in December 2018. Gower is represented by Chroma Projects, Charlottesville, Virginia. Um, Susan Schultz has been acting, local coaching, and teaching nationally for over 30 years. Currently, she is an associate professor of voice, speech, accent, dialects, for the Department of Theater and Dance at the University of Florida. Previous teaching faculties include the University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign, 
Virginia Commonwealth University, the Actor Studio at Pace University MFA program, Rutgers University Mason Gross School of the Arts, NYU Tisch School of the Arts CAP 21, Circle in the Square, Maggie Flanagan Acting Studio, the Lankladder Center, University of Northern Iowa, and served as a director in residence at Shakespeare's Globe in London, uh, United Kingdom for uh, Mason Gross School of the Arts from uh, 2003 to four. Uh, regional acting and vocal coaching credits include Hippodrome Theater, Illinois Shakespeare Festival, Montana Shakes in the Park, um, Arkansas Shakespeare Theater, Henley Street, Richmond Shakespeare, Playwrights Horizons, and uh, New York City, Mile Square Theater in New Jersey, Amphibian Productions, Texas, Colonial Theater, Pittsfield, Massachusetts, Berkshire Theater Festival, Massachusetts, Child's Play, Arizona, MFA Acting Rutgers University, designated link ladder teacher, teaching certification certifications in Knight Thompson speech work and the National Michael Chekhov Association. And last but not least, uh, Julia Townsend is an abstract artist and illustrator, as well as author. She is interested in the intermingling of chance and careful planning, both in art and life. She has degrees in art history and painting, including a certificate in TESEP from the Tokapi Palace in Istanbul. Presently, she runs a gallery and frame shop in Edenton, North Carolina, located inside the Peanut Factory Incorporated, a community-focused artist residency program, which is in the process of expanding to include a nearby conservation farm on the Albemarle Sound. Previously, she taught and exhibited in Spain, Germany, Turkey, and the United Arab Emirates. So I'm gonna stop sharing my screen and turn it over to the artist. Okay, great. Well, thank you for those introductions, Jerusha. We are really delighted to be here with you this evening um, for the showing of Geometric Alhamiya, a cultural transliteration at the Robert C. William Museum of Papermaking at Georgia Institute of Technology. Um, I'd really like to express my special thanks to Jerusha Graham for um, hosting the show and for hosting this Zoom chat. So my introductory remarks are going to address sacred geometry as sort of the cornerstone of this project. And I will reveal how sacred geometry is an intrinsic, implicit, and lasting symbol in the arts. So since antiquity, um, geometric perfection has conveyed sacred and collective beliefs by reflecting the fractal interconnections of the world. And humans inherently recognize these ratios as they govern all the ratios of the natural world, including those of our bodies. So these similarities cross cultures and they're found woven into patterns all across the world. And incorporating these patterns into contemporary works of art um, highlight the multi multicultural connections and they foster communications these despite language barriers, which remain really the overreaching um, goals of geometric alhamia. So these diagrams provide a little summary of what geometric, uh, uh, what sacred geometry really is all about. So if you look at the top left diagram, it uh, represents the Fibonacci sequence. Um, also known as the golden mean or the golden ratio. And then if you look to the right, uh, I hope you guys can see it, even though our pictures are there. Um, that depicts all the archetypes of nature, art, and science as pure geometric shapes. And they all derive from the circle. So using only a geometer's tool of a pencil, a compass, and a straight edge, um, it's easy to see how the circle um, is the source of all subsequent shapes and is often seen as the womb um, out of which all geometric patterns evolve and develop. So you expand from a single point to its perimeter. The circle implies the mysterious generation from nothing to everything and from the finite to the infinite. <clears throat> so 
To ancient mathematicians, the circle also symbolized the number one. And similarly, the number one creates all the subsequent numbers. Thus, the circle becomes the transcendental statement of the universe. If you look at the bottom left, the flower of life is composed of evenly spaced overlapping circles. And since antiquity, this design can be find, found in all the major religions of the world as it contains all the patterns of creation as they emerge from the great void or the divine source. So with the internal ratios identical to cellular division, the structure also signifies all the energy systems, including our human bodies. So with um, the color depiction shows the containment of the platonic solids within the flower of life. And in the bottom right, you see an optical effect of the flower kind of opening up in a spiral if you overlap three layers of the flower of life. So throughout time and across cultures and religions, the circle's inherent perfection denotes wholeness, unity, and the divine order of the universe. So whether you ascribe to a creation myth or the Big Bang Theory, the symbolism is really the same. Out of one comes the many. So it's easy to discover the ratios and the spirals of sacred geometry in nature. You think about growth spirals from pine cones to seed pods to nautilus shells and the fractal panners of trees. Um, but it's also quite common to see the ratios applied to man-made structures and designs. So whether they're classical or uh, modern, sacred or secular, um, ideal proportions can be mapped easily on iconic structures from all around the world. And while these are really beautiful examples of Islamic um, patterns in an interior setting, um, we could easily find similar examples in the great cathedrals of the world. Okay, Jorge. All right. Well, it's a pleasure to be part of this exhibition and with my fantastic friends and colleagues. Um, the history of our exhibition really starts in 2012 when Rennie and I were at a wine and cheese reception at Virginia Commonwealth University. And we started talking about the upcoming Tasmeem uh, workshops in Doha, Qatar, where VCU has an extension of the School of the Arts. And I was talking with Rennie about the idea of Alhamiya, uh, and we started talking about, well, why don't we take this notion of Alhamiya, which is an, uh, uh, an Arabic word for the transliteration of uh, Arabic letters into Romance languages. Mm -hmm. And one thing led to another, and we decided to make a proposal. So the proposal was accepted, and before we knew it, we were on our way to Doha in 2013 to be at the workshop. Okay, Rennie, I think I'm I'm ready for the uh, the next one. So in Doha, VCU, or as we call it there, VCUQ for VCU Qatar, has a fantastic school that takes in students from all over the world, but mostly from the Middle East. So there are not only a lot of Qatari students, but there are Kuwaitis and Jordanians, Lebanese and Egyptians, and just from all over the Arab world and beyond. And it was there, uh, well, you can see a picture of the entrance to the campus on the lower left. And of course the desert is, is right above it. Uh, we had a chance to visit that desert and it's pretty imposing. But it was there that we did our workshops, Rennie's paper cutting workshops, my perspective workshop, and also that's where we met Susan and Julia, who was in our workshops, in the paper cutting workshops. Okay, so we can go to the next one. So Geometric Alchemia extended uh, beyond the actual workshops on paper cutting and perspective to include, of course, Susan's uh, workshop on poetry um, and the wild colors of Kateri voices. And so as we were all working, we met and we realized we had a great deal in common. And at the same time, I was presenting a paper in conjunction with other uh, presenters, one of whom was uh, BCUQ, who is a, um, a physicist. And that led to an extended conversation on uh, what the concept of Alchemia meant in terms 
of the Islamic world and the classical world before that, and then, of course, the Renaissance in, uh, in Europe. Okay. So, and then this was already directly related to my work, which uh, had to do with perspective specifically, as was mentioned in the bio after the tragedy of September 11, I started wondering, how is it that something that we think of as Western as, as perspective, but which also has roots in the Middle East and in, in Arab optics and uh, studies in geometry, how is it that our two worlds could go so far apart or that uh, it could be they could be thought to be so far apart when in fact they shared so much in common? And that was one of the things that was reinforced in Qatar was that uh, the Muslim world and the West were really part of the same civilization and had been feeding each other information for centuries, even before the advent of Islam. So this uh, this joint understanding of all that we had in common contributed to the discourse and i think in, in all of our views made the uh the project an even greater success okay so um one thing that um just to maybe reiterate this particular tasmine was hybrid making and um that was the theme they wanted to um Kind of expressed throughout everything that was going on so the fact that we were collaborating across all these disciplines and with all these different personalities and people from all different cultures was a perfect sort of confluence of hybrid hybridity i guess if you want to say at one point we we thought maybe we'd have two participants maybe 20 maybe a member of the royal family you know it, it just kept shifting and we just decided we would we would um be prepared for whatever presented itself. So once we were there, um, we were given a lovely workspace um, that was a temporary sort of pop-up workspace gallery. And um, that's where we worked for a week with um, our participants. And we worked on designing motifs um, that they um, our participants could cut into their own paper cuts. And that part of the process took a little longer than we anticipated, but everyone approached it from their own sort of personal perspective. And we really encouraged that, that everybody bring something very unique to the table. And so it quickly shifted from a teacher student sort of conversation to one where we all became kind of equal partners in the collaboration. And that's when it got really sort of magical for me um, because we really started to riff on um, things that everybody else was doing. And I know Jerusha was um, uh, talking about the tracings that are in the show. And that actually came in through Julia's inspiration. And it wasn't anything we had pre-envisioned at all, but it became a very integrated and integral part of the, um, of the show. Um, so we, we worked for like three days on, on the pattern making and the cutting. And then um, the third day, we switched into Jorge's perspectival drawing workshop, where he was flipping a, a flat shape into a three-dimensional structure. And <clears throat> we thought that might be challenging to them. But here again, we are also proved wrong that it was simple. They recognized it intuitively, and they um, uh, understood the magic of it um, almost immediately. Um, and then the last day we were there, we spent um, installing the shop, the work, the, the show, and then having the presentations and the um, performances. So now, Susan, it's your turn. So starting um, with the costume attire that I adorned for the performance, um, I arrived here in this um, hijab and abaya when my students encouraged me to um, wear this as an invitation into their culture. I was um, skeptical at first. I didn't want to offend. And they, in fact, assured me that I, I would indeed be appreciating their culture. Um, and so this allowed me to step into somebody else's shoes and cultures and traditions. And indeed, this was uh, expressing the spirit of, and I'll borrow from what um, Rennie just said, the hybridity of what we were um, uh, doing as a collaborative effort. Um, the next slide um, talks about 
the workshop itself. And so um, as uh, running simultaneously to the paper cutting workshop, um, I was um, had my workshop participants exploring their personal relationship to their voice, both metaphorically and literally. And the workshop was named Reclaiming the Wild Co Colors of um, Cattery Voices. So the first thing that they wanted to do was um, uh, in a very playful imagistic way, they were to draw their voice on paper if they could have an image um, of what their voice was as it is. And then it, we had people um, riff in um, just in a train of thought, whatever was coming to mind about what they saw. So then words were gathered. And they then explored what stopped them from having the voice that they de desired. So both, both again, literal and metaphorically. And what we were finding out is there are anatomical reasons that the voice works and doesn't work. But then what we really wanted to start to uncover was the when the voice doesn't work due to social, political, cultural, gender, or family pressures. Um, and so the next slide is a are two images that our Afghan um, artists, which um, are they have um, backgrounds in calligraphy, and they decided to finish this investigation with these watercolors. And the other participants um, wrote poems to their voice, and what we're looking at is these creative pictures and poems um, eventually were what arrived in a presentation of a collaboration with uh, Rennie and Jorge. So how the hybrid happened is my participants and myself, we walked downstairs from where our workshop was and we wanted to see where our poems and pictures were gonna be hung. Um, and we peered around a wall and we looked into Rennie and Jorge and Julia's exhibit and the two Afghan artists were immediately drawn to the paper cutting. And they asked me to introduce them to, um, uh, to the others as they wanted to bring this art form back to Afghan. And thank goodness uh, Jorge and, Rennie were, and, and uh, Julia were so um, delighted to absorb them into the workshop and they because they really brought an aesthetic root of their culture and it spoke universally to all of us. Right, so it was awesome that they wanted to join. Um, and here's, the, again, um, they didn't speak English that well. One of them spoke better than the other. And so, you know, we were really communicating through the workshops, through the making and the patterning. So as, as professors, it's not unusual to collaborate and um, Jorge and I collaborate on a lot of things. And in this case, um, we collaborated on cutting this paper cut. Um, we really weren't sure what we were gonna run into and if we would have anybody who would um, wanna um, participate and make their own works. And so we came prepared to have a two person show, if you will. And so I came with two completely um, cut works and then we finished this one during the, the week. Um, but everyone um, just was so fantastic to work with that we ended up with just uh, an amazing group of works that, you know, we were just very um, excited um, to see come to fruition in, in the space where we were working. So Julie is going to give us some background on the people who were in our workshop. So um, I came up from uh, where I, from Dubai, where I was teaching at the American University in Dubai. And I had come a couple of years before I had done the course at the Tokapa Palace on Tezip, which is the traditional uh, illumination of the Quran, which you find all over Turkey. I'd, I was in Istanbul for six years before going to Dubai. And uh, so it was a common training of what the Afghan guys knew as well. So it's also um, a, a blending, a hybrid of cultures. The uh, Ottoman design of Tezip built on traditions that go back centuries 
from Iran and all different tribes that were coming, uh, motifs coming out of China. And the Ottomans turned it into a design of empire. So it united their entire, you can find their basic style, you can recognize from Egypt, you know, beyond Egypt, uh, all the way across the Middle East. Uh, so that's the training I'd come out of, but how freeing, uh, and you learn rules very carefully, but I just arrived at this workshop and just was thrilled with taking the training that I had and then putting it into this new thing with paper. Um, so it was it was quite exciting uh, for me. And that's uh, one of the pieces I did, which has drawing behind it. Uh, next slide. Um, this is a, uh, gosh, I'm blanking on her name right now, but she was a student uh, from Kuwait who uh, was in her senior year, I believe. And she had come down for this project. I think a family member had come with her. And I believe her training may have been graphic design. And she developed um, this huge piece, uh, really lovely. And the way um, Rennie had us working was t developing a square pattern. And once you're happy with that, then expanding it into a broader broader piece. Uh, next slide. Her father was actually the one who escorted her and allowed her to um, participate. And he was so excited when he saw what she had accomplished because she was in the oil industry and wanting to switch into the fine arts. And I think maybe this helped him visualize that she could do it. Something, and, yeah, people living a life. Um, she created this by working with the kirigami. You remember when you fold it up and cut it like a snowflake and you open it up and then mm -hmm. Created the initial motif. Yes. Okay. And this is our friend from, I, I think she's from Jordan. Sorry, I'm from uh, no, Morocco. Morocco, originally from Morocco. Um, and she was at the time, I believe she was based in Qatar, working there. Um, and she's, I think no longer in the Middle East, but she was very interested to take her Western, um, the bulk of her life experience, I think was in Canada in the West, but she was very interested in her roots and and design. And so she made a very, she took that square that we started with and made a vertical pattern with it. Um, so her work, she's very much a digital artist. So this, I think for, it was very freeing for her to, to put things into this, and it becomes sculpture, you see, even though you're working with paper um, and you're cutting it, you're working it on the table as a two dimensional surface. Once you float it on the wall and there become cast shadows from it. And this particular piece had little shapes you can see that came forward and back. So it becomes a relief. Uh, her piece in particular became very much that way. Um, and I think hers, you can see was you know, a great contrast to what I was doing. It's much more geometric. Whereas I was thinking about the motifs and the floral things that I'd been trained in. This this definitely has sharper forms. Next. Uh, um, this is a very young student from uh, Afghanistan. And he, I'm not sure if he had ever, his training would have been more uh, handwork on a on table with brushes and inks. And so working this way, I think, uh, put him into a new, uh, just a new way. I know that where they were studying, they also did uh, relief sculptures and things like that. But using paper like this, I'm, I think was a very new experience for him. It was a challenge to get that huge piece done on time. I think uh, Rennie pitched in on this one, uh, and maybe Jorge also. Yeah. You want to add anything there, Rennie, to this this one? Well, he's a wood carver, and um, they were he and his part his um, companion were being featured at the Islamic Museum in a in a beautiful show that featured works from Turquoise Mountain, the school that is was trying to save the cultural artistic practices of the Afghan people. 
And so they were both quite highly skilled in their own rights and their own mediums, but paper was definitely um, not part of it. So anyway, it was, it was a beaut it's a beautiful piece. It's very um, structural and architectural when you see it lit. <clears throat> and uh delicate you the the tiny pieces in that one that we just saw okay and here is tamim a professor from the turquoise mountain and you can see he's coming from this tazeep training that i am as well the motifs in it the very delicate and and i'm he could this very complicated design i mean he you you can see the years of experience i mean he sort of sat down at the table he didn't need any guidance at all. He's like, oh, I get it. And he cranked out this fabulous design. Um, and uh, his English was not that strong, but, you know, just brilliant work. So this is the piece, uh, because it is so fine with such details, we got the idea of tracing that on the wall as well, the same way my first piece was traced on the wall. And I should give a little background for that. I, I didn't always, I wasn't always drawing on walls. I had be been in a drawing conference with the amazing uh, Irene Barbaris, who's in uh, Melbourne, Australia. And she, I'd already done one drawing conference. Uh, we called it Crossing the Line. And we were just about, we, this, con this workshop fell in between the first Crossing the Line and the second Crossing the Line. So I'd already been drawing on walls and thinking about drawing in different ways through Irene Barbaris. Um, and then later, this show traveled to uh, Melbourne to Irene's gallery there. Yes, uh, your great efforts on our behalf, I must say. <laughs> Let me see. Okay, now this would be you, Jorge. Yes, and here we see again that concept of the hybrid. I am taking um traditional Islamic motifs, which as Dr. Saud said, were also based on Greek motifs, which were based on other things that were uh, traveling around the Mediterranean world thousands of years ago. So I took the uh, eight-sided tile and started playing around it in perspective, uh, creating courtyards and uh, just odd shapes as we see on the top right. And, and these imaginary buildings that commented on the juncture of Western perspective, Islamic architecture, and all the cross fertilizations that were taking place in the in the Mediterranean world. And so these were also commentaries on things such as intolerance or historical ignorance. Why don't we know more about each other? And the fact that I was also taking these flat shapes and depicting them in perspective, was also part of the of of the process because I was subverting notions of what is two dimensional and what is is three dimensional and and how do you turn an illusion uh, into something that goes beyond just representation and becomes um, symbolic. Okay, so we can go to the next slide, and then here we see the installations and this space on the right is where. Susan and I performed because she recited the poetry that was coming out of the workshop. And by accident, a couple of evenings before, we had been at a party uh, thrown by one of our colleagues and he had a guitar. I picked up the guitar and started just playing a couple of songs. And then Susan heard me and we said, well, geez, could we do something? So I came up with a few improvisations on the instrument, which I had borrowed to accompany her as she was dressed, um, as the students had requested her to dress. And the performance was in the late evening. Rennie was the empress. Together a huge audience. And Susan recited the poems just as the light was coming in and illuminating the paper cuts. And the combination of that late afternoon desert light, Susan's voice, the poems, and then the guitar accompaniment was something that I will remember for the rest of my life. And it moved both our golf audience and then the Westerners who were there. 
So this is the three of my works installed in the space and the two, the green and the blue one was where Jorge and um, Susan performed in front of. Um, um, I'm always trying to create a private space um, within the public one. So I use these complex systems as a way to slow the viewing process down or to counter that visual skimming that you do when you're just kind of floating through a gallery space. And I'm hoping that that will trigger a contemplative experience. And it was gratifying that the conference participants sought out our space and they kept returning to our space and, and they kept staying, they didn't wanna leave. And you can just barely see um, Tamin's um, tracing on the wall, kind of going into the corner between the red and the green piece. So Susan. <clears throat> So continuing off what um, Jorge was beginning to describe, which I find interesting that it was over cheese and wine that the final <laughs> straw, <laughs> there's a thematic chord here. So um, initially I was promised a, a venue for the recitation of the three poems that were written in the um, workshop. And when Rennie and Jorge um, became aware that I didn't actually have a venue, that's when they offered their space for the performance. And I was through the moon because I felt their space had, had a vibrancy. There was a temperature. It felt pure, um, like there was a conversation occurring between the artwork. So to me, it was a, a no brainer that participants would come into the space and linger. Um, we uh, rehearsed um, and it was really at the end of the day, it was an otherwise improvised performance. And our debut was in front of the paper cuts. Um, and the chair of the fashion department and um, Hanein helped me wear the abaya correctly. And Jorge provided three accompaniments. Uh, and they ranged uh, from a style of Delta blues to the echo echoes of Andalathia. Correct me with my pronunciation, Jorge, if I'm wrong. Uh, that's fine. Right. <laughs> <laughs> and that music we really felt matched the, uh, the voices of the poems. And the result and the feedback that we got is that it was culturally sensitive and it, re it was a respectful blend. Um, a hybridity of Middle Eastern and um, American approaches. And so happily our collaboration reflected this spirit of the conference, which was our university's interdisciplinary goals. So um, working collaboratively with all the participants was hugely rewarding and um, really joyful for all of us. I think I could say that. And when we made our initial proposal, we didn't have any idea what was going to transpire once, you know, it got accepted and um, it just, you know, we, we weren't sure what we were walking into, but, um, and, you know, the news is full of stories that, um, of the cultural clashes and the seemingly, you know, irreconcilable differences that we experience in our cultures and but it, that's not the story that we encountered we had something that was very open collaborative um and joyful really there was no angst involved at all and it was just um we hope that you know that's what our hope was for the project and um that's what we hope it continues to do as it travels um so what started in doha almost 10 years ago now has traveled to Melbourne and traveled back to Dubai with Julia when she was at American University in Dubai and the Crossing the Line Conference. I don't know which one it was, but here again, it was with Irene Barberas. And then it came back to the United States. And, and since then it's been traveling from coast to coast and you can see the venues listed here where it's all been. And um, so now here we are at the Robert C. Williams Museum of Papermaking, and this is our last slide, so we can answer questions that you might have at this point. So thank you for that presentation. Um, so folks want to know a little bit more about the uh, paper cutting technique and, um, and also the decision to cut vertically versus flat. Like in the drawing, you guys had it up on the wall and cutting vertical. Right. I think the um, on the walls, because of the sheer scale of the paper, it was about a seven by five foot sheet of paper. 
And so that would really be the only way to kind of handle that scale. And what you were seeing in the slide was the blue side facing forward. And that's the side we traced on and cut. And then when we actually installed it, we flipped it around so that the blue side was facing the wall. But because it was floating off the wall, it um, cast the color onto the wall and back through the piece. And so you get this sort of blue halo or aura around the piece. And then, the, of course, depending on how it's lit, it will also generate cast shadows that makes it look more dimensional. So my pieces um, initially were the only ones with color on the back. But um, when we had the opportunity to travel it to um, Melbourne, um, I asked all the artists if they wanted to add more work. And Julia added an amazing piece that's like this day glow yellow. And that's the one you used on the flyer. And then we added Jorge sculptures when um, it came back to the United States. And um, Tamin and Soleil working through interpreters at Turquoise Mountain, um, Tamin sent two more stencils to us that we were then able to cut in or trace into pieces for him. And um, Julia, you added more than one new piece. Oh, I did border designs. Right, you did border designs that could be traced. And um, and then Susan, of course, had all the poetry through her um, other partners and her participants. And so when we got back, we created a catalog and published the poetry as well with, with the catalog. So um, the actual... Uh, method for cutting paper is you use a snap blade or an exacto knife and you just cut the lines and so I, you know you trace your pattern and cut the lines um, it's very slow because you have to be careful but it's not hard and you just have to be mindful about what you're doing and uh, you're cutting from the back correct cutting from the back side cutting from the back because you don't want all that all the um tracing to show and you mm -hmm. want the color to flip so yeah but you could mm -hmm. cut on a table too it doesn't it doesn't really matter it depends on how big your paper cut is i mean so julia just made motifs and hers were definitely cut on a table hanan's was cut on a table most of them were cut on a table i mean i just go big <laughs> well, that answers that i was going to ask you um the uh the choice to work at that scale you know what was the significance of choosing to work at that scale? And also what kind of paper you uh, were using? Right, yeah, um, you have to use a fairly substantial paper, but I wanted to work at that scale just so it would be more immersive when you were encountering it. So I wanted it to be larger than life, obviously, and to create an environment with it. And so the paper I found that I could buy on a roll was Legion. Okay. Um, now, when we were at the workshop, um, uh, Slay, he actually had an incredibly thick um, rag paper, was almost like cardboard, and mm -hmm. it was very structural. It was quite a bit different, um, but then um, it worked really well with his more angular design. So it really just depends on how big you're going, but you do want it to have some st strength to it because it's just paper and you cut holes in it. It becomes a little more fragile the more holes you put in it. Mm -hmm. I was going to say, uh, Rennie's large pieces, of course, connote, have a connotation of carpets, carpets. when they're that big, tapestries. Interesting. I've started doing these things in vinyl that can go on glass and on the floor. So that carpet reference is coming through more, I think, Julia, now with pieces that you can actually walk on. Were some of the images computer generated or were they all hand drawn? Jorge, you answer that because yours. Uh, my images or Rennie's of geometric images? I think in, well, in general, the things that you guys showed during the. Well, um, my, I know mine are all by hand and they're done using uh, not Renaissance processes, but 19th century and early 20th century architectural practice. So everything is done by hand from start to finish. I think the whole show is done by hand, start to finish. Yep. yep. <laughs> Indeed. And that's kind of the point, you know, that it's not like 
and um, that you have to be invested in it over time to create it. And hopefully that translates into the viewing as a slower, more contemplative viewing as well. And, um, and I might add that the supposedly the geometrists who designed the interiors of mosques and all that detailed work that you see, they weren't figuring it out mathematically. They didn't, <laughs> supposedly, did not know the math behind it. It was just, you get a compass and a straight, a straight edge and a compass and you can do a lot. All right. Uh, this question is for Susan. I'm curious. Uh, um, did you the the outfit that you wore? Did you only wear it for the performance, or did you wear it during the entire time that you were teaching, or just during the performance? Um, it was one of the uh, one of many many. Um, cultural revelations that I had being American and going to the Middle East, I had thought that um, the hijab and abaya were only uh, for religious um, purposes. And uh, being there, I was really schooled by my students, um, letting me know that that is, um, that some sometimes it's uh, rooted in religion, but that it is a fashion and it is, um, not it, it's really it's 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 all over Europe as a fashion and so um it was just for the performance because again I wanted to have this hope that uh, we were crossing boundaries um I think it was maybe it was Jorge that wrote this I think it was gorgeous um this uh wanted to have this idea that we wanted that we all spoke the same language and that's a language uh that is without borders called art and so getting all this interconnectivity of Westerner and American and coming together. I think I may have even had a slight Southern accent in one of my poems. You I did. Think. I think. <laughs> yeah. Did. So, yeah, that's, yeah, what, that's what the one with the blues. Yes. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> now, if, if, if I may just interject something in here, because I was as conscious of all this as Susan was, especially with my background, because my, my ancestors are from Spain. And our contact with the Arab and Muslim world lasted 700 years. It was not always pleasant for either side. There were moments of tragedy, but what came out of that were 3,000 words of Arabic origin in the Spanish language and forms of art and music that crossed not only into Spain, but into the whole Western world. Right. Um. And that that uh, that history and background. I'm curious. Um, I know that it's traveled a couple of times, and and with adding the sculptures, and you know, it's it's had several um, iterations. Um, the choice not to, I guess, it comes up in artist talks like this, but not to have. Um, some of that uh, uh, history presence, like uh, outlined for the viewer in terms of wall text or anything like that. Was that a conscious decision or just the nature of like the show had really come out of working with your hands? And so that's kind of how it has continued on. Um, that's, that's a, a good question. And, you know, some of the venues have created a different content to go with it and kind of leave it open, the door open for that. Um, I know at one venue, they created their own PowerPoint that, um, tied into some of their, um, art history courses, uh, you know, focused on the region and they had that projected in the gallery with the show. Um, uh, others have, you know, sort of adopted um different shapes you know to kind of um uh put quotation marks around things you know like that that curved arc you know of the mm -hmm. mask you know on their signage walls uh, obviously you can incorporate the color you know um the, the emerald the cobalt the copper which is you know intrinsic to all the glaze glazes used on the tiles that you know inspired me um, so there's lots of ways to open that conversation up, you know, through um, different links to art history. And I mean, Jorge, when you were in um, 
Kansas, um, they tied in all this um, sort of religious, um, you had a conversation. Can you speak to that a little bit? Yeah, and actually Kansas City was an extension of um, what you and I experienced in Lynchburg and also when we were up in Pennsylvania, but even in the Middle East, I was very conscious of the fact that because some of my work crosses over into a little bit of political satire, actually, that it might be offensive in particular to Middle Eastern audiences or people from Muslim backgrounds. And the exact opposite was true. They got the humor right away. They got the bittersweet aspect of it, that it was commenting on a tragic time, the, uh, on a period in which these misunderstandings really are not grounded in anything real in many respects. They're, they're more imaginary than real. And so they responded to that very positively. And I remember when we were in Pennsylvania, there was a woman of, I believe, Pakistani origin who talked to us afterwards and said, I get these, these really speak to me. You've captured the architecture and recontextualized it in a way that, that speaks to me. So that was always very heartening. I am preparing myself for the day when somebody says this is wrong. And I suspect it may be um, a Westerner. I mean, we seem to be much more sensitive to these issues than folks in the region. Hmm. About the sacred geometry, you know, being a, a universal language, you know, that we can, that we all intrinsically recognize those ratios and have similar sort of um, references for what they mean. And it doesn't seem to matter where you're from in the world. And they, they, they all, I haven't found them to be different, you know? And so that like just celebrates how much we're alike and yeah. celebrates, you know, who we are as human beings rather than who we are as divisive cultures. And so I think that's a really important aspect of the work for me is to highlight something like that rather than where all the division and the strife is, you know, percolating underneath. Yeah, and that really is struck by going through this again and remembering all the participants and where they were from, how much that is resounding in bringing us all together from all different regions in that area. Yeah. yeah. Oh, that, I, I, I got it. I was gonna um, ask about the designs, right? So, uh, uh, Julia, you pointed out that the, like, is it Tazheep? Um, is he? Yes, the, the motif seemed more like floral in nature versus the more uh, geometric, like angular geometric designs. And I was curious, are those designs used in similar ways or like, one you'll see more um, for tiles versus rugs versus, or just it's more related to region. Do you guys? Uh, I I mean the floral, the more floral work is definitely seen in the Quran, uh, on the traditional illustrate illuminated pages of the Quran or the seal of the Sultan, that sort of thing, um, going back centuries Persian documents and so forth um the more um angular since I I didn't study that quite as much though it, it when I look at it, it it's of course following the same rules of balance and and so forth um proportion um those are found more where would I say those I, I want to say they're more contemporary uh, Jorge, what do, you, what, what do you think more, when you think of more angular or Rennie? I, I think they're as ancient as, as the yeah. other. You know, I mean, just it, probably by region somewhat, um, for sure. But I, I mean, I can think of some Roman floor uh, mosaic patterns that are very angular. Yeah. Um, mm -hmm. I'm thinking of Zinjir, which is the chain design, which actually you can also find on the floor of our local post office here in Eden. <laughs> but, uh, uh, you know, some 
things that if you, you know, if you dig deep, it's, it's, it's universal. So, but what I particularly studied ha has that, um, the floral motifs and then the, the arching forms, they, they called it Rumi, which means Greek as if it came more from the Western side of the Ottoman empire. I don't know how true that is. So that the Chinese forms would be the little flower motifs and then the Rumi would be the Greek. So it was kind of from two sides of the Ottoman empire merging together into their design forms. Um, Julia, that makes perfect sense because in Morocco, which had more of an influence on Spain, it tends to be more geometric. And I know from my research that there it was the tile makers who would take a square tile and then rotate it and join it to other smaller or larger tiles. And again, because they couldn't read or write and they had never studied math, it was all intuitive, but they got infinite combinations of highly geometric shapes. Yeah, yeah. Those chain patterns and interwoven patterns in the Middle East, in in Scotland and Ireland and all the Celtic works. I mean, it just migrated along. I really think it just migrated along the Silk Road, you know, from the East to the West. And um, you will find, you know, I mean, there's a, there's a, a myth that you're not supposed to have um, figurative elements in, in a lot of the Middle Eastern patterns. <laughs> Really kind of a myth, you know, because it's well, Rennie and I were at the Museum of Islamic Art in Doha, which if, if anybody ever gets a chance to visit it, it's amazing. And there's a, a room full of Korans and they were illuminated Korans, very similar to Western illuminated manuscripts, full of people inside them, which supposedly is a no-no. So here were, you know, entire populations within these illustrated Korans and the only exception was the prophet himself. His face was just a white blank oval. And that was mm -hmm. it. Thank you. And our two Afghan artists were featured in the show that was at the Islamic Museum of Art at the time. And that's why they were in the country. I, I have so many more questions, but it's, it's getting to be that hour. I did uh, want to ask Susan, is there any audio of the poems? So there's the catalog, but is there any audio or video of the, is there ways to access the, like online or anywhere like that? Or can we post? You can or post. These? Okay. Yeah. All right. There's three, there's three videos. Um, separate videos and they're each each video is a is a poem with the accompaniment by a an original score by Jorge <laughs> they're beautiful and um we we didn't let's see what do we do we didn't uh, record them on site at the conference when we got back um uh, to um VCU home campus because all three of us were at VCU at the time we were able to recreate them in a black box theater and have them recorded. So they're a little different than what actually occurred at the conference, but they're beautiful and you're welcome to share them. Oh, wonderful. So anybody that's interested, give me a couple of days, maybe end of the week, beginning of next week, and I'll have those up on the website so that folks can see that as well. Okay. Um, I've got some house cleaning things to do. So I'm gonna share my screen once more. I wanna say thank you to our um, presenters. Again, if you're uh, in Georgia or coming through cause we've got the Hartsville airport here. And if you've got some layover time, uh, this show will be up through December 6th. Um, if you enjoyed this, uh, presentation and would like to help support the uh, museum. Um, we are happy to accept donations so that we can continue to offer some free programming. Um, and if you want to keep up with what else is going on at the museum, you can check our website or or and or follow us on our social media. Um, 
as you can see here, uh, we're on Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, and Pinterest. Or if you'd like to get our newsletter, uh, shoot an email to our education curator, Anna Dahl, at anna.dahl at rbi.gatech.edu. Um, we've got a lot, lots of great programming associated with this uh, show. The next um, programming is uh, in-person uh, tunnel book workshop, A View Through the Arches, and that will be September 28th. We've got uh, paper making with uh, local Georgia artist Robert Thompson in October, October 7th. Um, we'll have a uh, midpoint reception in person Friday, October 13th. And then if you want to join us again virtually, we'll have um, Dr. Natalie Casal and Dr. Mohammed Gomi uh, speaking on November 8th. Uh, and then a quilt mosaic uh, workshop November 16th and a paper cut workshop December 6th. Wow, that's wonderful. Yeah, so lots of programming, lots of ways to engage with the uh, uh, topics, concepts, and techniques found in the uh, exhibition. Um, uh, Dr. Kazal, who will be speaking in November, will be um, giving some perspective from the School of Modern Languages, and uh, Dr. Gomi will be talking about some of that math that that's the... Um, uh, foundation of these designs. So thank you guys so much for uh, giving us a little peek inside this process, this collaborative process. Uh, hope that it gets to travel to many more locations. It's a great uh, exhibition and we are really excited to have the uh, show here at the Robert C. Williams Museum of Paper Making. Um, Thanks everyone for attending. Thank you. Thank you, Arusha. I'm really honored to have been included. Thank you. Likewise. Thank you.